Hello, Bible lovers from hither and yon. When we return, what you need to know about the text of the New Testament. One fact of the Bible through most of its history is that there weren't printing presses, and that meant the Bible was copied by hand. Now this not only introduced a possibility, but the inevitability of changes being made in the text, mostly through human error, but sometimes through intentional decisions made by scribes. Now, in the case of the Old Testament, when you read the Masoretic text in Hebrew, you'll come across passages where the text has obviously been damaged, where letters or whole words are fallen out or have been pointed incorrectly, sometimes to the point where the text is totally unintelligible as it stands. Now, when this happens with the MT, scholars will typically check out the handful of other ancient versions of the Old Testament available, such as the Samaritan Pentateuch, one of the fragments of Qumran, the Syriac Peshitta, or even the Latin Vulgate and make an emendation so that your friendly Old Testament translation reads smoothly. But what about the New Testament? Well, I spoke earlier in another video about biblical inerrancy, and in that video I argued that we have a verbal inerrancy that pertains to the words of the Bible itself. Now, I'm going to have to qualify that a little bit because inspiration can only really apply to the inspired human author writing the Bible originally, not the scribe copying the Bible centuries later. So now we see the problem. Yeah, the Bible's inerrant, but only in the autographed copies, the ones that were first written by Paul, or Luke, or Matthew, and so on. We don't have these autographed copies, and of course what we have then are copies of copies, or copies of the copies of the copies. Actually copies that in many cases are many, many generations removed from the originals. So what scholars have to do is closely compare the various versions available and reconstruct the original copy as accurately as possible. The art and science of this reconstruction of an original text from later copies is called text criticism. Now, as I mentioned before with the Old Testament, you really only have a handful of versions to compare. And so the reconstruction is not so much about finding the original text, in that case written by, say, Jeremiah or Ezekiel, but in fixing the Masoretic text in those places where it has been obviously corrupted. But in the New Testament, we have an embarrassment of riches. I'm rich! I'm wealthy! Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of copies from over the centuries that many, many generations of scholars have poured over. From the beginning of the church, really, but especially from the time of the Renaissance to nail down the exact text of the New Testament as precisely as possible. So, how does text criticism actually work? Well, when you read the ancient copies of the New Testament, you'll notice that while there is wide agreement between them, you'll also notice that there are minor textual differences between the different copies. Now, these differences are called textual variants. Most of these variants are due to simple human error in the process of copying the text by hand. Now, try this yourself. Try to copy a seven or 800 word essay by hand, looking back and forth, and then trying to see, to check to see how many mistakes you made. You'll be surprised. Now, furthermore, once these mistakes appear, they in turn get copied as new copies are made of the old copies. And this way, more errors and omissions creep into the text. And of course, the scribes knew that errors were a problem, and so guess what? They took it upon themselves sometimes to fix errors or what they thought were errors in the text that they were copying. But in doing this, of course, they introduced still more changes into the text. Now, this became a real problem by the Middle Ages, where you can find Catholic scholars complaining openly about the poor quality of the manuscripts in use in the important universities in the church. So what kind of textual variants do we actually encounter, and how do we choose between them to reconstruct the original? Well, the most common variants are simple scribal errors such as omitting words, that's a haplography, or copying a word twice, that's a dittography. You also see a lot of transposition of word order and phrases too. 
Then we have the homeoteleuton. Now that's a long word, but not a hard concept. It occurs when a scribe copies the ending of a sentence and then on turning back to the original, begins copying from a later sentence that ends the way that the first sentence did. Now, as you see in some examples, that can result in the omission of a whole section of text. This comes up especially where text repeats itself a lot. One example of this is in the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. Now, if we look in this chapter at verses 14, 15, and 16, we see the phrase in Greek, ek tu kosmu, from the world, used four times, and also the phrase, ek tu poneru, from the evil one, used once. The fact that they repeat four times this prepositional phrase, from the world, all ending with the ending ooh, well, there are a variety of different versions of this uh, section which circulated in antiquity. Some of these versions omitted the ending of verse 14. Some omitted verse 15 entirely. Some omitted verse 16 entirely. There are even some versions which has Jesus praying in verse 15 that God would keep his disciples from the world, ek tu kosmu, rather than from the evil one, ek tu poneru. Well, once text critics had enough ancient versions to compare, it became pretty obvious that this was a homeoteleuton. And what you see for John 14 through 16 in your modern Bibles is almost certainly an accurate re reflection of what John originally wrote. Now, we also have the phenomenon known as Idicism. This is when certain scribes, instead of copying one New Testament at a time might have one scribe read the text aloud while several others in the room heard and transcribed the words that they heard. Now, this is a very efficient way to produce many copies quickly, but there was a problem occasionally with the pronunciation of Greek vowels. Sometimes the vowel sounds could get confused. For instance, in Romans 5.1 is the text, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, or is the text, let us have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a pretty big difference, I think you'd agree. Is peace with God to be seen as a present possession, or is it a hope that we must expect later? Well, the difference in this comes down to one single vowel sound in one single letter in one single word. Either a scribe mistakenly heard an Omicron when he should have heard an Omega, or he heard an omega when he should have heard an omicron. Then there are glosses. Now these are little explanatory comments which scribes wrote in the margins of the Bible, and occasionally these accidentally became part of the Bible text itself. Now, the most famous of these is found in Matthew 6.11. Because it was part of the Didache, that's the ancient teaching in the church, and the, also the ancient liturgy of John Chrysostom, a scribe dropped into the words, Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever into the Lord's prayer. Now, these words were copied into the original text of that prayer as we find it in Matthew in some pretty influential Byzantine manuscripts, which in turn led to their incorporation into the King James Bible. Now, pretty much everyone today recognizes these words were not original to Matthew. Now, Protestants generally still say the doxology. Why? Well, because tradition. <laughs> Why don't Catholics? Because scripture. <laughs> Some variants occur because of deliberate scribal changes made out of a conviction of what the text ought to say. Did you know that most of the best ancient manuscripts do not record the story of the woman caught in adultery that the scribes and the Pharisees were going to stone, the one that appears at the end of many versions of John chapter eight? What happened with this story? Did someone mischievously added to the Gospel of John because it was left out of one of the other Gospels and they felt it, thought it felt well, well into the context? Or did a scribe piously remove the story out of a fear that it would lead to moral laxity in the way Christians treated adultery? Now that was what St. Augustine thought. Likewise, did you know that the words of Jesus from the cross in Luke 23, 34, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Now, these words are actually absent from most of the best ancient manuscripts. In other words, if you were a Christian, say, in Alexandria in the 5th century, the Bible you knew that was read to you every Sunday would have lacked these words. So are the words original to Luke and some scribe removed them because they thought them inappropriate that Jesus would be forgiving his crucifiers? Or 
did a scribe add them because Luke's gospel tends to portray Jesus as maximally forgiving. Likewise, did you know that once there was a scribe so enthusiastic for defending the dogma of the Holy Trinity that he added to 1 John chapter 5, 7, and 8 the words, and these three are bearing witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are bearing witness on earth. This is the so-called Johannine comma, and it was part of the official Latin Vulgate text for centuries and translations based on the Vulgate like the Douay Reims. Now, since it is missing basically from every ancient version and also every Greek Bible prior to the Middle Ages, it is today universally regarded to be an addition and not part of the original first letter of John. And did you ever read the end of the Gospel of Mark? The original ending was at Mark chapter 16, verse 8, where talking about the women who left the empty tomb had fear and amazement, and the women said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's where the Gospel of Mark ended. Say what? Early scribes were so bothered by this ending that in different times and places, they took it upon themselves to write new endings to Mark, drawing typically from material in Matthew and Luke and from other places, so that now, in the tradition, there are at least three or four different endings to Mark, some of which extend all the way down to Mark 16.16. But the overwhelming likelihood is that for whatever reason, the Gospel of Mark really did end with the women running away, afraid, in verse 8. So, how do we know the original text of the Bible? Well, one way is just by looking at the ancient manuscripts. We have a handful of mostly pillar manuscripts from the 4th and the 5th centuries. These typically dominate consideration. These are mostly complete Bibles. They're magiscals because they're written all in capital letters with no punctuation and no spaces between the words. These are uh, manuscripts like Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus, and Codex Beze. And by the way, a codex is just a term for a book. Now, how did we come by these ancient Bibles? Well, some of these versions made their way into Western European libraries uh, from the East in the 17th and 18th centuries but the real gains in textual knowledge actually came in the 19th century. Now, Count Constantine von Tischendorf performed the massive work of recovering the ancient Bible manuscript known as Ephraimi Rescriptus, so named because this ancient Bible from the 5th century was actually erased and written over in the 13th century by monks who figured, huh, what the heck, we got enough Bibles around here and since good parchment is really expensive and scarce and hard to come by, let's just erase this Bible and write over it various sermons of St. Ephraim. Now, an ancient book like this with layers of writings from different periods is called a palimpsest. Now, but centuries later, as the search for more and more ancient Bible versions reached a fever pitch, scholars realized that all due respect to St. Ephraim, the erased Bible version written underneath was actually far, far more valuable. But recovering the writings below required a painstaking examination of the markings left on the parchment. This is an animal skin written on centuries before. Now, previous scholars had only transcribed little snippets of this, but Tischendorf had a fantastic eye for this and was able to complete the massive project in about three years. Now, this was already an enormous success, enough for any scholar to rest on for his entire career. But Tischendorf was not done. He received patronage to become a sort of Indiana Jones of the 19th century. Instead of searching for the Ark of the Covenant, however, he went in search of ancient Bible manuscripts, and no place better to do that than in Egypt, where parchment likes the consistently warm and dry temperatures that you find there. So after traversing land and sea, he made his way to St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And as the story goes, while staying with the monks there, he noticed that little pieces of parchment were being tossed into a trash basket that the monks were using to start fires. Now, he prevailed on the monks to let him examine the parchment, and on the parchment was written the oldest, most complete Bible manuscript known then or now, what came to be called Codex Sinaiticus from its place in Mount Sinai. 
it goes all the way back to the 4th century. Now, the 19th century was enormously important for archaeology, and Tischendorf's contribution to biblical archaeology is really the most splendid example of this. Now, by the way, uh, Codex Sinaiticus is available now for examination electronically at this online web address. You should check it out. Now, in addition to these great core pillar manuscripts, there are also papyrus fragments of the New Testament that are actually much older. The oldest papyrus fragment is P52, and it is a piece of the Gospel of John that dates back to the early 2nd century. Now, you want a good name for a Christian rock band? Well, how about the P52s? Now, there's a panoply of embarrassment of riches of later Bible manuscript copies, ancient translations, commentaries by the church fathers. Now, with manuscript evidence, most scribal errors can be ferreted out pretty easily. But what about cases where deliberate changes have been introduced to the text? Well, sometimes text critics default to rules of thumb to make decisions based on internal considerations. One of these is that the shorter reading is preferred of all the variants, and that's because over time, Scribal changes tend to add material to the text rather than to remove it. Another rule of thumb is that the harder reading is to be preferred of all the variants. The idea here is deliberate scribal changes come about to resolve textual or theological dif difficulties rather than to introduce new ones. Every now and again, though, it happens that the shorter reading seems like it could also be the harder reading, or the harder reading and the shorter reading and or the shorter reading is also the least well-attested reading. Well, that's when text critics start to really have a discussion and debate among themselves about which is the best reading. Here, the best reading is gonna be the one that can explain all the variant readings. And there are cases where text critics just aren't sure, and usually they'll tell you that too. Nearly all modern Bible versions will make the reader aware of various important variant readings in the margins. And if you take our Greek program here at CDU, you can learn the critical apparatus yourself to make your own informed judgments about what the original text most likely was. Now, it's important to keep these textual variants in perspective. Yeah, there are a lot of them. It's hard to read more than a verse or so of any New Testament book, in fact, without coming across at least one textual variant. Most of them are totally inconsequential. For instance, like calling Jesus, Jesus Christ, or Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ, or even Christ Jesus. Doesn't change the meaning much. Ditto things like the spelling of place names, the spelling of proper names, and so on. Changes in the tenses of verbs are something you find a lot too, and these are also totally inconsequential, usually so. On the other hand, examining variants is important because the original text is the one that God inspired, not the one that the scribes copied. And so therefore getting as close as possible to that original version is crucial, since the variants really do sometimes affect our ability to understand the word of God and to penetrate as deeply as we could in it. Now this is why when you're writing an exegetical research paper, the first step in interpreting any passage is to look at the textual variants in the critical apparatus, or at least a critical commentary that does this, to arrive at an informed decision based on the evidence as to what the original text was in the Greek, because that's the one you're going to be interpreting. Now, sometimes beginning Bible students do get a little kvetched by the number of textual variants in the New Testament. They wonder, well, how can we be sure that the text we're reading is accurate? But we need to remember that while getting back to the precise original text is always useful to penetrate more fully into the Bible's meaning, Variants are never so important that you're going to find a variant in which Jesus didn't rise from the dead, or where he wasn't born of a virgin, or he didn't give the keys to the kingdom to St. Peter. Well, the fact of the matter is that so many copies of the Bible were made in antiquity, so many translations, so many commentaries, that we have well over 99.9% .9 certainty of what the original text was, down to the smallest jot or tittle. We know more of the Bible, in fact, than any other book of antiquity by far, and we know more of the original Bible than at any time in history, because experts have been working together for centuries to sift through many thousands of pieces of evidence as they've been discovered. Discovered in old libraries, discovered in 
in long forgotten caves, discovered in other places as well. There are no doubt many ancient copies of the Bible out there waiting to be discovered, even in cases where ancient copies of the Bible were erased to make room to write something else over top of them. In these cases, experts now have the technology to recover old erased versions of their Bible, again called palimpsests, and they do this now by means of sophisticated 3D spectral imaging technology. Now this will enable us not only to find more Bible texts, but to read better the ones we have where it happens that the passage of time has dulled the ink in many places. Though there's every reason to believe, therefore, that in the future, our knowledge of the text of the New Testament will be even more complete than it is today. Well, that's the text of the New Testament. Let's see how much of that you remembered.